Let me, uh, let me open us up in prayer and then uh, we'll start out by opening up for questions before we get started. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for another opportunity just to come in here and to just study your word. God, I pray that you will make things clear. God, as this becomes <coughs> very technical, can become very muddy sometimes. Father, I pray that at minimum, we walk away here just amazed at how intricate and how beautiful this whole chapter of Genesis 1 is. God, help us to fall in love more and more with these narratives, these stories, these poems, these things that we've read over and over in our whole life. and Help us shed new light on it for us, Father. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Okay, so I want to open up for a couple of minutes just for some follow-up with regards to last week. I know we have some who've... Some who've joined us this week that were not here last week, and I, I want to re-emphasize that this is the type of study that it's okay if you're in and out, not a big deal, because we just continue, it's not one that you have to build on necessarily. You'll always be able to get, gather and gain new information no matter which week you come in and, and that kind of thing. Also, I have been rudimentally like recording it audio-wise, so if you want, if you have not listen to last week's and you weren't here, but you'd like to, just let me know. I'll show you how to get, get onto that and be able to hear it or at least, or watch it, whatever you prefer. I'm doing my best to try to keep it somewhat audio recorded the best we can. I know we have some issues with audio wise and, uh, and I, I just apologize for that. The thing is, is that I, I have to like draw a line somewhere and until God provides some, someone to come forward who wants to just take over all the recording and all that stuff, all the technical stuff. This is just what we'll get because <laughs> it becomes too distracting for me, unfortunately. And so I have to kind of step away from that thing, concentrate on the main thing. So last week, we dove like head first into Genesis chapter one. And for those who weren't here, you'll never believe it. But we got through one, chapter one, verse two. <laughs> and so <laughs> we made it from Genesis one, one and one, two. And we spent a whole hour talking about Genesis one, one and one, two. Hour and ten minutes. Well, he's already got a headache. You see that? See that? Look at that. So I want to open, I want to open the floor. As you guys dwelled on this information, thought about it through the week. Hopefully, what questions came up? What what clarifications would you like, or what questions have you always had that we didn't talk about? Okay, before God separated the day from the night, there was nothing. What does nothing look like? Mm-hmm. Yep. Nothing's not dark. Yes. One thing that I regretfully did not overemphasize last week, do a good job of overemphasizing, is the idea of the material versus the functional. Now, our 2023 mindset is focused here, always. We exist in a scientific mindset. We want to understand the material. We are not necessarily a, the most giant metaphysical type. We prefer material understandings. And so when we read Genesis 1, this is the lens through which we have a tendency to read Genesis 1, which is why when you read Genesis 1, questions arise, problem, problems arise, but you have to fill in a whole bunch of gaps between the verses. So between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, people will add millions of years to fit the material aspect to make this work. However, the ancient writers have no, like, they don't, how do I say that? They don't care about the material world. In fact, that is not at all their mindset. Their mindset is the function of creation. For those really nerdy people, they're dealing with an ontological I don't know how to spell this very well. So ontological creation, not a physical creation, ontological creation. In other words, it's not about the what about creation or the how, it's about the why. And so Genesis 1, 1, 1 Genesis chapter 1, is a poetic, beautiful, literary structure that is helping man understand the why as to why creation exists. Not the how or the what. Now, I, am I saying that it, that it couldn't be seven literal days, seven figurative days, 24 hours, you know, 24 periods? The, the truth is, I, I have zero clue. I don't, I don't have a clue. I have a, I have a leaning towards 24 literal days. God can do all this stuff, right? But the truth is, is that that was not the point of Genesis 1. Genesis 1 is giving us the why, and it's giving us the why of creation. What's the point of it? What's the purpose of it? Through the mindsets of the modern day you know, of the, the ancient day, the ancient people. 
So through the eyes of the ancient Israelite, through the eyes of the ancient Egyptian, Canaanite, they're going to read these things and they're going to, it's going to make sense to them because they have their own ontological understandings. This is that biblical cosmologies that we looked at last week. This is an Israelite one, but that like Egyptian pictures, Egyptian gods, how their creations came. They always came through their, their creation mythologies always came about, um, by stuff that was already materially there. And they don't lend any credence even trying to pretend like, oh, this is where that material came from. So Genesis 1 in the Israelite view is going to take that material world and insert the God of the Israelites who is outside and exists outside of that material world. Why? Because it has its own purpose or its own function within Genesis 1. So God or Elohim, the God of the Israelites is going to come in and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. This was created in your myth, but here's why it was created. And it has nothing to do with necessarily a material understanding. Now, I, like I said, I, I know that gets tricky. People get really weird by that because they, this is what we've been ingrained to understand. And, and I, I want to emphasize that's okay. Like that's okay. But if you're going to look through this lens, it's going to require you to fill in blanks in between verses throughout all of this. In fact, you're going to have to dig deep and speak outside of scripture in order to help understand how, how something can be formless and void, but yet there's water, there's darkness. How can there be material things when there's formless and void and all these things? It's just, it's a snowball of you have to now ha- come up with a material uh, explanation for something that the text is not even uh, attempting to, to offer. Let me put it in a slightly different way that has nothing to do with creation. The biblical authors in no way are interested in proving God. None. Their starting point is God is there. Now let me show you what God is functionally, purposefully giving examples why he's there and what he is doing within creation, not how he is there. It's the same thing that they're doing in Genesis 1. It's telling you the why of creation, not the, the what or the how or giving you a chronological detail necessarily. That's not the point. Does that make sense? That's why we have so many different viewpoints on creation. Yes. Because nobody knows anything. Red flag number one for anything in scripture is if there are very, very smart people who completely and utterly disagree, red flag number one. Mm-hmm. Like complete opposites, we probably missed the point. You probably missed the point of what, was, what they're, they're arguing about. Are one of them right? Yeah, maybe. Will we know in this lifetime? No, probably not. So is that the point? What, do we, what are we supposed to get at as far as the point goes? And there are people who are way, way, way smarter than me who very much disagree in, in Genesis 1, 1, and 2. I think our real problem is we think there was somebody, oh, here's day one, but I'm going to write down what's happening day one. Yes. And this is day two. There was nobody around. Right. Which is the point of this class is to help kind of break down some of these myths or these misunderstandings. Not, not that people are like maliciously trying to go out and say like Moses sat down and wrote, you know, chronological material beginning of everything. But that, again, inspiration, we're not there. And unless somebody is willing to look into who was there and how it was there and how literature th- throughout all the world at that time was written down and whatnot, then, then that's how those myths develop. But Moses can write something, but also never put pen to paper for Genesis to be Genesis to be written. You know, it's just that's not how it works. It doesn't work the same way as it does now, as far as that goes, in a way. Any other questions? So we we are to get one particular thing out of one one and one two, and that is that God created everything that's up there and down here. There's the there's the there's the material he just did, right? This is a prologue. He did it. He materially did it. And now, and now we're going to get the why. And the why is how did everything start when he created it? What was that? that anybody, I'll give you bonus extra points, Jim Crane. If you can remember the, that, that lovely description of what the pre-created world was described as in Hebrew. Formless and void. Okay, yes. Formless and void. Say it. I know you know it. Tohu vavohu. Okay, so we're going to put that up here. The reason why I like to... to pronounce that va vohu is this is going to be very important to understand when it comes to hebrew much of hebrew in the hebrew world 
each word has this kind of dual thing going on with Hebrew. You have meaning and sound. And in Hebrew, we'll use this over and over and over to make theological statements or make statements about the literature that they're writing using both in parallel. Well, you lose the sound part when you translate it to an English word. So you get tohu vavohu, you get wild and waste. That's more formless and void. I, like, I use wild and waste in English because I think it's a little closer to like sort of what the word play is going on. But once you understand that there is wordplay going on through this all over the place, then certain elements of how wording is going to be chosen all throughout scripture will make more sense, right? And so tohu vavohu, wild and waste, this is every single ancient, <coughs> excuse me, ancient civilization's mythology description of the pre-creation state. Every one of them. They are all... They all have this wild and waste. Now, it's shown in two main ways, and we're given it here in, in verse 2. What is the pre-creation wild and waste? What, what does that look like? And you, you brought up in the question one of the elements of the two. So what does a pre-creative state look like in this wild and waste world? Okay, but what physically, materially? We'll just do that. Okay, chaos. But how is that represented? Darkness and? Light. Well, not yet. Darkness and what else is, is, is there? Huh? The deep, the abyss, the water. So we have darkness and chaos waters. And as we went through those ancient Israelite, and I'll, I'll make this announcement one more time if, if you weren't in here. Last week I did a really terrible job of helping tie together some of the ancient cosmologies. These two books here are amazing and very, very nerdy, but they show you how the ancient cosmologies are working and how that's working in, in, in co coinciding with the biblical creation story. So if you'd like to look at these or take pictures of them or whatever you would like to, you can look at that. This is a normal pre-creative state, darkness and void. So now what we're going to see is we're going to see a, an entire chapter that is so incredibly well designed that I'll just, I'll just show you this. Thank you to my wife who made one of these. Anybody ever mess with these? Probably younger people. Okay, some of you, okay. Probably, probably the much younger people, right? What, what were these little deals? What's this? Yeah, yeah, right? It'd have to count, right? This is like high technology when you're so bored and you don't have, you know, social media or phones or anything. You're like, let's fold papers around and make stuff up. And then they pick something and you can open it up and it'll show something different, right? This is a sort of representation of what Genesis 1 is doing. And you're like, wait, what? Because what's happening, and I'm just going to pre-warn you, Genesis 1 is so incredibly technical that the most difficult thing that I've done here is try to figure out how to make it not so just mind-numbingly technical. If you want that, I have some resources. Just come see me afterwards. I'll, I'll, get, I'll point you into the direction of it. I'll just tell you that it's so incredibly technical that Lauren probably can attest to this. This afternoon, I was watching another video that I'd found over it, and I was just going, oh, oh my goodness. Like my brain, in fact, here, I'll just show you. I won't explain any of it, right? These are slides from the YouTube video that I was watching, right? It's showing like all of these connections and my brain was just going i don't know what to do with any of this. it is brilliant it is absolutely utterly brilliant for you to be able to start seeing it though one of the one of the greatest things that you can do is to go through and begin to highlight last week i told you that one of the things you can do is to try to highlight the words anybody take me up on that try to try to do any of the highlighting of the repeated words and stuff like that yeah Okay, so what kind of things, let's just start this. What kind of things did you start to notice when you were highlighting words? Same word you use a whole lot. A whole lot. Can you give me some examples? Anybody? Evening. Huh? Evening, Evening and morning, yeah. Light, Light darkness, huh? And God said. And God said. Let there. Let there. Earth. Earth. Expanse. It was good. Waters. Lord God. Mm -hmm. uh, heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. Heaven and earth. Anybody try to do different the different colors by chance? Did you happen to notice anything about some of the different like the different colors? I don't know how to ask this without just showing it, but I don't have a good way to show it. 
Did you happen to notice that there would be certain sections of colors that happened here, then didn't happen a little bit later, and then it would show back up like in another section? Like light, if you paid attention to light, if you highlighted light here, it would, well here, I'll just show it on Step Bible. Let's just do that. If you mirror my screen, which it's not, of course not going to do, of course not. If you highlighted light, do you see how there is a, a clear section here that light is only in this section right here? And then there's nothing here, right? Until you begin to scroll down. Oh, look, there's another section of light. There's another section of light. As you begin to do this, you'll start to see that there's actually a lot of those little things like that. There'll be a section where light is mentioned a whole bunch, and then it'll skip it for a while, and then it'll go into the next section of light. Then you'll highlight some other words, and you'll see the same thing. You'll see waters. Waters will do the same thing, right? If you go through waters, click on the waters. Okay, chapter verse 2, and then there's a section of it there. And then you'll scroll down, and hey, waters show up again. As you begin to do this, you'll start to notice this, and knowing that it's doing this, you'll start to pay attention to the fact that, hey, this is highly structured on purpose. Why? I've taught you in many other classes, there's certain structures, types of writing and structures that are popular in the Hebrew scriptures. Can you name, name one of them? Yeah? Like a chiasm? Yeah. This is a great way to understand sometimes when the chiasmic structures happen, you'll notice that the light will be up at the top and the light will be at the bottom. If you read Esther, it does that a lot, right? That's a good way to, that this will start to show up. This is not a chiastic structure, however. What I've given you, on, uh, on, if you notice on your handouts here, is I've given you this little deal here. And before we get to this, which is what I'm trying to recreate here for you, I want to show you the overall literary structure of Genesis chapter 1. Verse 1, we're given this very... Oh, let me clear that. Verse 1, we are given the problem. Verse 1 and 2, we're given. We've got land. That land is tohu vavohu, pre-created state. That looks like darkness and a deep abyss of chaos waters. There's the problem. Tohu vavohu, problem. Then what you're going to get to see is the next, you're going to get two triads, and this is important to understand, two triads that will begin to fix these problems. You'll get day one, darkness. Oh, done, taken care of. Order brought to darkness. Waters. Oh, oh, good, done. God took care of that. That's day two. Day three. Oh, he's going to bring land and give us edible plants. Well, guess what? It's no longer tohu vavahu. It's no longer chaos, darkness, and water. We now have dry land. We have life. We have new life that's brought into these first three days of the creation state. Except it's not done, as you know. So now, if you look at this overall section, Genesis 1-1, going through chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, or the beginning of chapter 3, is the whole literary unit you need to pay attention to. And you know that because they, they, they have the, a direct parallel to how they start. In Genesis 1-1, you get in the beginning, God created the skies and the land, everything that was up there. But in the end of it, chapter 2, verse 1, Thus, it was finished. So it's not the beginning. It's not when he's created. It was finished. The skies, the land, and all of their host is now added. And this is so brilliantly put together that as you begin to look at this in the Hebrew, which I would never expect you to do. Somebody else way smarter than this told me. I never didn't figure this out. So don't think I'm like genius. This is not me. You begin to see the verse one. There are seven Hebrew words. Verse two, you're going to get two sets of seven Hebrew words. Then you're going to get a two-part triad, three and three. Then you're going to come and it's going to finish what verse one says, and it's going to build on it. So if you remember, anybody ever remember reading a Proverbs where it'll say like 10 times this plus one? So this is a popular, in, popular way for Hebrew writings to overemphasize something really important. So we'll take the seven words and the, se and the 14 words or two sets of seven. And now he's going to give you three full lines of seven words, three sets of seven. And the key word will end the whole thing. It'll say, because on it, he rested from his work in which God had created to make. In the beginning, God had created. So this right here, overly nerdy, you can pretty much wipe this away. But this right here is to show you, you think this is intentional? 
You think this is just some random, like, so-and-so made so-and-so, he had this much, he's... So can you see how when you're reading this and you hear the repetitive nature, especially in English, and you don't understand how just so incredibly well-designed this is, it becomes very quick for us to go, oh, okay, 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 seed according to the kind, according to the kind, plant, seed, water, okay, okay, he made everything. Don't do that. <laughs> understand that this is so brilliantly written that you get this. Okay, so let's dive into this a little bit. I told you this is going to be technical. I don't expect you to remember any of this. Other than the one thing I want you to walk away is this is brilliant. There is nothing like this. Nothing like this. So we have, we're going to go into the triads. And the way that the triads work, what I mean, the triads, we've got th two sets of threes. And you'll notice on day three and on day six, you get like a bonus thing. If you're following the repetitive nature or the, the lined out, the way that this is all laid out, you're going to get on day three and day six, you get kind of a bonus thing, by the way, like on each one of those. We'll dive into those as well. So we got two sets of three plus a bonus one. This is something that will continue on all through scripture. In fact, when you get to the Exodus narratives, what big 10 things do you see happen that lead that helped lead the Israelites out of captivity in Israel. Yeah, the 10 plagues, right? You'll never guess how the 10 plagues are set up to, to, to fight not only the Egyptian Pharaoh, but also the gods of Egypt. They're set up in three triads. And then the ninth one, it's actually three triads plus one. That 10th one, which is the death of the firstborns, right? Three triads plus one. The ninth one, you'll never guess how it ends. What, is, what does this one start with? In the beginning, the, God created the skies and the land. And the very first day of creation, what does he do? Let there be light. The ninth one, let there be darkness. And so now what's happened is this is all undone. In fact, if you follow the three sets you'll watch them undo everything that was done here, like metaphorically through each one, of these, each one of these plagues. And it will lead to the plus one. The plus one down here, man. Plus one over here, death of the firstborn, death of man. And you'll notice as you follow these things through, as you begin to start to pay attention to the laying out and the literary structure of these things, you're going to start to see so much. So we've got this. Keep this in mind. I think this is a really good way to say this. So if you'll turn your hand out, well, let's go through this just a little bit here. The reason I've tried to put this up on the board and I've given you a handout and everything is because for me, this is just so difficult to see. But the way this is lined out is as you begin to look through it, you'll see that this is the beginning, the land. Everything is wild and waste, uninhabited. It's unordered. It's chaos, right? The very first thing that God is going to do is he's going to bring light. Where is this light coming from? It doesn't technically matter, but we know it's not coming from something in creation. It's got to be coming from something else. It's coming from God. Now, you'll find out as you continue to read through Scripture, Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus was there in the beginning. There's light. He will be considered the one who will bring that light in, in Revelation at the end of it. The chiastic structure of the whole Bible, well, there will be no more night, no more darkness, right? It is coming from the one source and the source of all that is God. So he is taking, he's facing all of these. So now we have light, no more darkness. Day two, he is going to separate He's going to separate the waters from above and the waters from below. Then you're going to get day two. The waters above are going to be held back by something. The waters above, this is a picture. This is why we kind of go with the snow globe situation, right? The waters above are going to be held back by this thing called the rakia. Now, the waters above are not where rain comes from. What this is, is it's a reflection. It is a heavenly reflection of the waters below because there's no land here. So just like it is below, there's also above. This is another sort of section of this tri tripart or triadic structure, right? You have the heavens, you have what's below the heavens, and you have the earth. And what's happening is the way God creates everything, there is supposed to be communion between all of this because it's bringing order. And then he's going to fill these sections up with man and with stars and heavenly beings. But then down here, you'll find out later what, what the rest of that is going to come in. 
So he's going to separate the waters above from the waters below, bringing immediately order, right, from this wild and unordered. Then we're going to get in day three. I want the waters below to gather. And guess what? Now we're going to have dry land. So now it's no longer going to just be chaos water because there's nothing survivable in a water world. <laughs> you cannot survive without land. So now he's going he's going to bring such order to it that now he's separated everything and he's filled it all. But then we're going to get a bonus. You know what else is going to be on this land? Life plant, seeds, fruit trees, hint, hint. I wonder if they're going to come back into play here soon. Seed and fruit trees, hint, hint. I wonder if those things are going to be a big deal, right? But there's still one thing that's not fully here yet. Are these inanimate objects? No. That's kind of a trick question. <laughs> are these alive? Do they have the breath of life in them? No. No. Why? Because we are still in the wild and waste. The wild is now ordered, so the tohu, we're good. But we're still un uninhabited. So we get this idea of life, but you know what? Something needs to emerge from this ground, that's plants. So now we're going to go back, and we're going to go through all three sections, and we're going to inhabit them. So day four, you're going to see, and God separates the light from the day, the day, the, the day and the night. And he's going to place two things in the day and the night, no, over the day and the night. What are the two things that are to rule the day and the night? The sun, and the, the sun and the moon. Now, if you go and pay attention to where it says that he filled or went to the sun and moon, you go to verse 14. This is what it says. Oh, mind you, verse one or day one, you see, and God said, let there be light. And there was light, right? Yeah. So now verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens and the expanse up here right? In the expanse of the heavens, let in the expanse of the heavens and to separate day from night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Do they have purpose? Yeah, they're going to have a purpose, a major purpose, right? And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so verse 16, and God made two great lights. What are these? The sun and the moon. Why is the sun and the moon not mentioned? Did you notice what your, what's your version say? The greater light and the lesser light. Yeah, why are, we all know this. Is there any question that, that it's the sun and the moon? We clearly know this is the sun and moon, right? Have you ever heard the sun and the moon mentioned in the Bible? Well, it, it is. <laughs> huh? Say, say what you said. Yeah, so the, the, the sun unanimously in all polytheistic religions are always worshipped, right? If you remember Egypt, Egyptian cosmology, what is the deity that, that is the sun god? Ra, Ra right? Yeah. So what's happening now is, remember how, remember how I told you there's this uh, other type of writing that takes place, right? <laughs> it's called polemical. What's happening is now in the act of God bringing order to things, guess what he doesn't? necessarily create how about the gods of all of these all of these surrounding nations in fact one of the surrounding nations that they're going to deal with a lot is the canaanites right the canaanites have a god a, a, a sun deity you want to know what that deity is called <laughs> thank you so much yeah his name is shemesh shemesh right the Canaanite deity, if you'll just Google it, I would show you, but it's too much work now, is named Shemesh. You'll never guess what the Hebrew word Shemesh is in English. It's sun. The same exact thing happens with the moon. The moon god is the Yarech. You got to go when you do it, right? It is the moon god in the Canaanite religion, the name of the moon god. It's also the Hebrew word for moon. So what's happened now is he's set, he's filling, remember, we have order, we have, but now we have to inhabit. We're inhabiting with two great lights. These two lights work in one function. And what is this function? Huh? Yeah, to do what with day and night? What does it say? Mm-hmm. 
But what does it say specifically that they are to do? Govern. Yes, to govern. In other words, anybody else's translation? Mm. Rule. Okay. So these two lights now, they're going to be the ones that will rule over the light and the darkness, which means the light is not coming from where now? So God has now handed over, handed over duty to the hosts of the skies. The two great lights that will act as one to bring order, to help separate day and night, to continue to make time and seasons pass. So what else is up in the sky? What else is going to be up in the sky created? Yes. So now we'll also be including the stars. But you know what the stars are not given? Yeah, they're not given rules and authority. So we have a lesser host of some sort who are under the rule of two greater hosts working as one who are continuing God's work within his ordered creation. Now, if you begin, this is where this starts to happen. Okay? We have, right now we're looking at it like this. Now you can take this exact same passage and look at it like this. Because what we have is we have day one, God brings light and day, day four, he's going to hand over to his creation, the hosts that he's now filled in his creation, part of the duties to continue his creation. But you know what? This one can also fold down this way. And when you fold day four down, what does that land on? Day six. What two things are created in day six? Man and animals. We get a poem a little bit later about the man. How does God make the man? What does he decipher them to be? In, their, in his image, male and female. Two parts. And what are their, what's their job? Yes, to be fruitful, multiply, and to, to rule the beasts. So now we have a direct link between the two part of man, God's creation and made in his image, the host that will fill the, the land, not the heavens, the land, and they are to rule the animals. But what theologically is being said is this, you know, what is to never to rule the, the sun and the moon, you know, what is to never to rule the man and the female cut to Genesis three. What three characters do we find in the fall of Genesis 3? Yep, man, woman, and the serpent. Who's the serpent? Satan. Satan. We find that on the New Testament. What is Satan called in Isaiah? What is he also, uh, what is he, what is he shown as in the garden? So now what's happened is you're watching an unfolding of both of these narratives where Satan, the morning star, the one that fell from heaven, will also, according to Ezekiel 28, be in Eden. He is the pinnacle of all of creation, but he has a job. And he will rule the beast, or he will rule man as a beast. He's more crafty than any other beast of the field. Can you see how there's like two layers to this narrative that's happening? It's not just, it's not just a random animal. It's not just supposed to be Satan. It's working in multiple layers. This whole thing is now going from tohu vavohu to now the skies and land and all their, all their hosts are all filled, completed, and given one specific major adjective throughout most of the, the reading of chapter one. What does God sit back and say it looks like? He says it's good, right? This is all good. This is good. So you get to man, you get, oh, he's very good. So now everything from this point forward is all about how all of their hosts in all of these realms are doing everything they can to bring back wild and waste, chaos. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 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 And then think that you're going to like this next statement. What we, we talked, we talked about male and female were given the opportunity to rule the beast. And then what were they also given? They were given a blessing. What was that blessing? You said it earlier, be fruitful and multiply. 
Did they say that up here? Nope. Nope. So think about it. What is the curse to the serpent? One day, the seed, that fruitful multiplied thing of a woman will come and kill the serpent, right? Will crush the serpent. So think about Genesis 6 now. What is this? This is what happens when the great and morning stars come down and, and, and mess up the seed of man. You get giants. You get Canaanites. You get Babylon. You get Nephilim. Can you see, I mean, can you see how this is all like, I mean, brilliantly structured and telling you the whole story, of the whole setup to all the scripture. But here we are, we're thinking we're talking about stars and, and man and trees. Like, no, there's so much more to this. So just like it folds this way and it folds this way, if you continue down, God's going to separate the waters above and the waters below, and he's going to create the great creatures of the, the abyss, right? Yes, the tanin. These will come back to play later. The great creatures of the abyss, but they'll also fill the sky, the heavens, the things below the firmament, all of this extra area right here, they'll fill. And then in day three, God said, let the waters dry land up here. And we're going to get, again, humans are going to be created, but also animals are going to be created. And then I want you to go back to Joseph narrative, right? The Joseph narrative. What was the foundational point of, of how the whole Joseph narrative starts? What is it between the brothers that, that causes the huge rift? Jealousy. Jealousy between the older sibling and the younger sibling. Now let's go back to Genesis 1. Who's the older sibling? Who's the younger sibling? Who's the f- blessed and, and favored one made in the image of God? Who's the one that are just set up there used for a time clock? Can you see that this whole, like every motif that we read from here forward of the older sibling and the favored younger sibling, it's all spawning and telling two stories of the humans falling and failing, but also there seems to be some sort of a celestial story also taking place. And you get hints of this. And what happens when you, by the time you get to Revelation or by the time you get to Jesus, what's he doing? He's trying to unite these again. He's bringing the blessing through the seed of the woman. He's trying. Lo, what's one of the, one of the famous sayings Jesus is going to say all the time while he's here on earth that something is near? The kingdom of heaven. In other words, what happened is at Eden, there was a great chiasm that took place or chasm that took place. These, the tripart part of creation is now looking like this. And what Jesus is doing is he's trying to build and bridge a gap. Insert Jacob's ladder. Insert John. Lo, you will see ascending and descending on the stairs. I am that ladder. I am the temple. Jesus will be that connection, that way back to earth. Lo, the kingdom of heaven is near. By the time you get to Revelation, all of this will now become one and will merge into one giant, perfect creation the way that it was meant to be. Okay. Can, but <laughs> it's true. It's so true. Okay. Okay. So no, but no, but no, he's bringing up this point, right? This is, this is where, this is where, this is why I want to have this class because so many well-meaning and lovely and amazing Christians cannot get along because they're so stuck on literal seven days or seven periods of time. Does evolution fit into this? Does it not fit into this? Is there a God that just set the ball rolling and then sat out? Or is there a God that's intimate? Can you see that when you read this, this is not the point at all. You are, you are missing the point because the point is, is that everything we see today, exactly the way you said it, has been happening since the very start. Every aspect of what God chose to do when he handed over to the lights And he handed over to the man within the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, he created the light, the heavens and the earth. Everything he did was a partnership in helping to continue his ministry within those realms. Cut to Peter and Jude when it says, by the way, those angels that did not keep their heavenly abode, but came down in the days of Noah 
every single time these things happen, when man begins to allow the beast, which will be anthropomorphized version of Cain, the beast will be the sin. It will, it'll, when we let the beast rule us, what does it lead to? Death, destruction, exile, sin, murder, taking advantage of the, of the, of the weak and the needy. Meanwhile, Jesus is going to come in and go, no, 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 guys. That's not what it looks like at all. Blessed are the meek, are the poor. The ones who will say, hey, I'll take it on either cheek. The ones who act like they are the ones, the ruling ones, looks different than what happens because the animal is now taking place, right? The beast. And what happens when the, the partner parts of the celestial kingdom also don't keep their abodes and they have a, have a fall just the same way? Well, this is where we get to now. This is where we live, where the beast is ruling every aspect of this world. And we can see that. And our job as Christians are to, to act the way that Esther, the way that Daniel, the way that Moses, the way that all these people do in the midst of being in exile, enslaved, under bondage of sin, under pain of, of toil and murder and chaos and war and rumors of war and destruct the whole earth. What is the whole earth doing? It's trying to like implode on itself, not just humans, storms. How many times have we heard this is a once in a hundred thousand year storm we're seeing, a flood. How many more, you know, how stronger are these things getting? How more frequently are they getting? It's because every aspect of his creation is trying its hardest to fall back to this. And man's job is to help continue bringing order. But we do a terrible job at it. Which means Jesus himself will be the one. God will be the one who will step out of his heavenly abode, come as the, the seed of a woman, and he will conquer the thing that's, that's, that's creating all this mess in the first place, sin. Thereby bringing heaven and earth, the kingdom back together. Now this works in a million different ways, but these seem to be the, the two simplest ways to look at it at this moment. So I wanna, for the last 15 minutes, I just wanna open up for some discussion. What, what, what are your thoughts at this point? What are your, what's standing out? What kind of things do you solve questions about? Yeah. Uh, reading it and listening it two times for this study, I have just come to that conclusion that, like you said, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Why do we have to clutter our minds with something that God did? So this doesn't matter. The, the why, what, or I mean the what and how or whatever, but. It's the fact that he did it. Yeah. I don't understand why there's so much. Well, a lot of it is still well-meaning. I don't want to even say things badly about that because for me, th- this has been looking at, okay, Second Peter talks about how we have a always be prepared in season, out of season to g- give an answer for the hope that we have in Christ. The truth is, is that there's a, we have a reason and a hope to believe in what we believe. And we can, there's whole, a whole study called apologetics. We can even study enough between the ideas of the science and the materialistic world and the, and the biblical accounts. We can see and fill in a lot of the gaps and blanks to make it fit to where, hey, look, this isn't that far off. So what that does is it builds bridges between people who will never step foot in here because they're like, I don't, I don't believe in that mythology. And so it is well-meaning and can have a purpose until it becomes divisive between Christians. Mm -hmm. And that's where we have to step back and go, okay, even though this stuff can be good, now we need to go, okay, but what was the point of this between Christians? Because I'm not trying to build bridges with Christians necessarily at this point. That wasn't the point. The point of this was that, hey, thank God, we have the ability to be Christians because Christ took care of this for us. That's the point. The building bridges needs to take place outside of the walls of the church. And that's where we just... How does how the psalmist calls us by, na- natural, by nature children of wrath? I mean, every aspect of us wants to bring everything in our life back to wild and waste. Some of us in here have had this conversation about how we're so good at just burning our bridges down and breaking ourselves up. That's our nature. But our biblical part, the part where God says, no, 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 no. Your job as my image, by the way, the word image here, any idea what this word image actually means or is? 
if I remember correctly, I think it's Salem, like T-S-A-L-E-M, I think. Somebody can look that up. Image, Salem. You have Step Bible pulled up? Image is... Yeah. It's T-S-E, Step. Salem. Okay, so it's Salem. So if you were to look at Salem, click on the Salem if you're on Step Bible and go to the usages. Look around Exodus. What does it say a Salem is used? How do they translate it into English? If you can, yeah. Image specifically. Okay. Scroll, scroll, just keep scrolling down if you can see it. Okay, go to, let me just do it this way. No, well, maybe, but without looking up here. Exodus chapter 20 is going to tell us not to make, oh, I forgot. That's what, that's what I'm missing. A graven image. A graven image. So this is a different word, but one thing that I don't have up here right now is that there is a double, dual part to this, what I showed earlier when it comes to the word and the meaning. What happens now in a Hebrew word is you will get something like tselem image. It will have a meaning and a sound. Now the biblical writers can use tselem as a totally different word, rearranged a little bit like a, a, a homo, is it a homo, homo, homophone? So it's, it's, it's like lead and lead. It's same letters, but different words, right? That can work in, in the Hebrew word. But now you can take not only the actual little word of tselem, the image, and you can put in a different word, a graven image, and it will mean and relate back to the same thing. Tessel. And the, the graven image, huh? P-E. Yeah, P-E-S-E-L. And so what's happened now is he says, hey, don't make a graven image or an idol, right, out of wood or out of anything. Why? Because he already has those. You don't have to create a, a statue representation of a god because we are the idol. We are the graven image. We are the image of the great creator in earth, on earth, right? And that is our purpose. That is our point to the point that I've already forgotten where I was even going with any of that. <laughs> right? So there you go. Somebody clue me in. Where we even started from there? I know, right? I was talking about image. Yeah. Yes. You can go a step further from that. Take the E's and turn them to A's. And it's pasal, which is to mm. you, like a cut. Yeah. And the only difference in the Hebrew is a dot over, I don't know the letters. Yep. Over the... Middle and the last letter. Yep. Yep. Genius. This is another one of those homonyms. It's the same exact word. Seven and complete. Same exact word. Two meanings. Two, two, or same exact letters. Two meanings. But yet, now what will happen is the biblical authors can use seven and it will represent or, you know, speak in meaning complete or full. Mm Mm-hmm. Seven, well, he speaks five Hebrew words, but I probably, you, you'd have to get to that. I don't remember off the top of my head. So that being seven and complete and full would be like on the seventh day. God yes. So this is why I showed you at the beginning that structure here of the seven Hebrew words that start Genesis 1, and then the three Hebrew sentences that, that complete everything that are three three sets of seven. As you go down this, you'll start to see all throughout Genesis 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, God is used in 35, Elohim is used 35 different times, which is five sets of seven. Land is used 21 times, which is three sets of seven. Sky and dome are used 21 times, three sets of seven. And then you get all these repeated words like light and day, light on day four, living creature. You're going to get sevens and sevens and sevens and sevens because by the end of this and knowing that seven will will represent completeness and wholeness that it's it's theologically making a statement that everything when he created it was complete and done except at the end of day seven it breaks the pattern which we talked about and it breaks the pattern in a very specific way it he rests but there's no evening and morning the seventh day why 
because now we exist in that seventh day, bringing everything back to chaos, back to tohu vavohu. But seven is the perfect number, mm-hmm. three plus the four, right? Three for God, four for man. I'm not, I'm not a super numerology type person, so I, I'm taking your word for it, but yes, three, three is obviously a, a big huge representation of of many things eight usually stands for like newness or the newness of life like the fresh start this is why he was he raised from the dead on the eighth day not the seventh day that has a whole um figurative meaning but yeah i i fall down that rabbit hole way too quick when it comes to numerology so then i have to step back and be like all right i gotta I think that gets in the weeds sometimes pretty quick, so but there's clear. You're saying God, you're about that. You're talking about in the Hebrew Bible. In Hebrew. Not um, necessarily. Well, no, in the NIV English, the... in the English, it should, rep- it should, every time it says Elohim in, in here, it's going to say between uh, chapter 1, verse 2, and 2, verse, chapter 2, verse 3, it's used 35 total times, which is one whole section, one whole chapter, ultimately. Now, English, we put it in, we split it up a little too early. We started chapter two a little too early, too early, but that's okay. One last thing that I think is interesting that we can dive into a lot more at a different time. What we also begin to see is a pattern unfolding here. This is just another version here now. This is going to be the exact pattern that will be laid out when it's given the, the how to build the tabernacle, the completion of the tabernacle, and the Jewish temple. You're going to see everything laid out in in the same patterns, in the same representations and things like that, as we're given here in the first first chapter of Genesis chapter 1. It continues to go down if if, if this is the second page to that. So you don't have to remember any of this, but it's just, this is one of this book right here. If you want to see something super nerdy and really amazing, it's called The Tabernacle Prefigured, and it's all about how from day one, Genesis 1, the tabernacle, the temple, the church, it's all, it's all in, enshrined within the patterning and the layout of Genesis chapter 1. So it's, it's nerdy, but there you go. Last but not least, I'll, I'm not going to go through each one of these. As you begin to go through and highlight these words, I forgot I had these. You'll begin to, this is how you start to see that these patterns start to fit together. Day one, day four. Light is mentioned in both, right? Many, many times. Let there be light. Same patterns and that same thing. Same deal on the next one. Day two and day five, the dome, the, rak- the rakia, from the waters above, waters below, the evening and morning, second day, same patterning through the highlighted sections. And the same thing in day three and day six. You've got the plus one. You've got the same repeating words and phrases in both. And so this is why I always recommend, like if you have highlighters, if you'd like to take things a little, little further in, it's not necessary, but it, to me, it becomes very visually much easier to see because you'll notice as you're highlighting a certain color, there's a big gap, big gap, big gap, and then, oh, I got to highlight again. Oh, I wonder if that's a, on purpose. And it's a good way to begin to understand how the literary structure is happening here. We did not cover everything at all. We barely covered, scratched the surface. But did you learn something that you didn't know before? Anybody it can be very tech. Can you see how it, it, it gets very technical very quick? And it's okay for you to walk away going, oh, oh my goodness, I just like, okay. At minimum, walk away going, this is, whole, this is so intentional, it's so beautiful, it's so amazing. It's not just a bunch of repeated words and phrases that we've heard a billion times ever since we became a Christian and started going to church. It's saying something, and that something somehow fully relates to us now. And for me, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's really showing that, hey, somebody is, is, has been and is, will be and always has been in control. And while we're really good at bringing everything back to Tohu Vavohu, that God is constantly trying to bring us back, back into an ordered, beautiful, blessed version of the kingdom of heaven here while we're here on earth until the kingdom of heaven becomes the new creation, the new earth.